ES Audio. From the Evening Standard in London, I'm John Weeks and this is The Leader. It's been an unusually dramatic few weeks in banking. Here's the short version. First, Nigel Farage said he'd been dumped by Coots over his political views. Then, Coots denied that, and the BBC ran a report claiming a senior source said it was because he didn't have enough money. Then, the Brexiteer said he had a document proving his original claim. The BBC apologised, and their source outed herself as the CEO of NatWest, the owner of Coots. Dame Alison Rose has now resigned. Nigel Farage wants more heads to roll. You cannot breach confidentiality. So she's gone and it's right that she has gone. However, I think this brings into question the whole of the board. You know, the, the, the chairman of the NatWest Group, the CEO of Coots, the subsidiary. Frankly, because of how they behave, I think they should all go. He was talking to BBC Breakfast there. The affair has opened a rare door into the workings of high-end finances, raised questions over how banks handle controversial customers, and ultimately led to the resignation of the most powerful woman in a male-dominated sector. Told you it was dramatic. And there's a lot to unpack. Our financial editor, Simon English, has been working on the story for The Evening Standard. So, Simon, Alison Rose isn't known for making mistakes what exactly happened here? So she made, a, a, as you say, a very rare mistake, which is that she was chatting to a, a journalist in the BBC and said something that, that she shouldn't have said in regard to uh, Nigel Farage and him no longer being able to uh, bank with them. Um, I suspect this was just a casual conversation. She perhaps didn't recognise the news value <laughs> of what she was uh, talking about. And until that moment... Uh, one of the things that she was known for was having sort of immaculate PR, you know. She was always very measured and very thoughtful and she she was chatty. She, you know, you liked her. At the same time, she was never uh, going to say anything um, outlandish to you. And so I think this is sort of un- uncharacteristic of her, I, I think it would be fair to say. And we know Nigel Farage is calling for more resignations at NatWest and at Coots. Do you think they will come? Yeah, well, I think that they will, actually. So Alison Rose is uh, the first person to pay the price. There are other people involved. There, there's a question about the chairman of NatWest, Howard Davis. There must also be questions about um, the people who, who work at Coots. Maybe the chief executive there, maybe uh, he's in trouble too. But I think that will ease off for a while. Now what we'll have is kind of a corporate inquiry. They'll look at it. And my guess is that further down the line, at some point, you will see that so-and-so has moved on and so-and-so has moved on. But the big scalp here is Alison Rose, and that's, that's how it will stay, I suspect. And is it unusual for banks to close customers' accounts like this? And what are the consequences? Well, it turns out it's a lot uh, more, more common than we realise. That's one of the things that Nigel Farage, whatever you think of him, has uncovered. So there are lots of people whose uh, accounts get closed. Sometimes it's because they're just not worth the banks having an account with, the the unbanked, as we call them. In other uh, occasions, and you can have some sympathy for the banks here, it's to do with financial crime reasons. That obviously doesn't apply in Nigel Farage's case. But banks have to be very, very careful about who they are accepting money from. And, And the big issue one of the bankers was telling me the other day is unexplained wealth. If there's suddenly a load of money in your account that the bank can't understand where it came from, that's a problem for them. So I think this occurs at two levels. There's the people with absolutely no money who are unbanked. And then there's the people who've just got loads of money in suspicious ways. And then there's this third group that Nigel Farage has uncovered, who the the bank has just rather foolishly decided it doesn't quite like the the cut of his, his jib. It doesn't think Nigel Farage is inclusive enough So therefore, they've excluded him, which obviously logically makes no sense. And Coots has been making a lot of its B Corp status recently, which is for companies and institutions with environmental credentials. Can banks really make moves like that and have customers that contradict their values at the same time? For example, Farage isn't exactly on the streets with Just Stop Oil. No, indeed. It's a very interesting issue, isn't it? I think that that what will happen from now is that we, we will see banks talking a lot less about that sort of issue, precisely because they don't want to run into another Nigel Farage 
problem. So the other day, for example, Ian Botham said that he didn't agree with that recent report into racism in cricket. He just said there isn't as much of it as this report says. So have Ian Botham's bankers got to suddenly disown him because he doesn't think there's as much racism as officially there is? There are supposed to be. I mean, I, I think it opens all sorts of problems for banks. I think what you will see is banks and other organisations talking a lot less about social purpose and those things and uh, doing more of just getting on with uh, what they're supposed to be doing. And when we talk about Coots specifically, a bank that's usually so secretive to the point they won't even confirm or deny that the royal family's on their books, even though they're famous for it. How uncomfortable do you think the bank will be that so much of how it works is now being openly discussed, particularly in the gossip columns? Well, it's a big hit to them from a PR point of view, isn't it? They had this snob appeal and this this notion that the Queen was a customer, although, of course, they never they never talked about it. And that has gone, hasn't it? They now just look like any other bank and a rather sort of slightly grubby one, don't they? I, I wonder whether in two or three years' time, Coots will even exist. It, it's, it's this bank that goes back to 1600 and whenever, and it's ended up as part of NatWest almost by accident. Does NatWest really want it? And is that brand worth much anymore? I think it's a fair bet that um, before too long, the name Coots will, will disappear. We've heard from Nigel Farage that he's been rejected by nine banks now. Is anyone going to give him another account, do you think? He'll get an account somewhere, won't he, as long as his uh, affairs are reasonably in order. What should happen, one of the new tech banks should come out and say, we've got an account for you, Nigel, we'll be delighted to have your business. I don't know which of the new tech banks that might be, but one of them should should do just that. It would would, uh, make some news, wouldn't it? Let's take a break now. In part two, Simon discusses whether sexism in the city played a role in Alison Rose's resignation. One view certainly from women in the city is that were she male, she wouldn't have had to fall on her sword, that there would have been a different approach to this. It would have been, OK, he's made a mistake, but we're going to back him. Going back to Alison Rose, in your article for The Standard, you said she was the most powerful woman in banking. Can you kind of give us a tangible idea of just how powerful she was? So um, NatWest is is one of the biggest banks in Britain. It's one of the biggest mortgage lenders. So many of us are customers of it in all sorts of ways. It's a vital cog in the UK economy. So it and Lloyd's and Barclays and HSBC are just these massive entities. And um, their ability to lend us money has a massive influence on how wealthy Britain is and how wealthy it feels. So for governments, these organisations are vital. I mean, in the case of NatWest, the government still owns 39% of the shares. So it's that integral to British GDP. And what effect did she have on that West itself? And did the culture change at all? So she was a breath of fresh air. One of her predecessors was Fred Goodwin. He he was Sir Fred briefly until it turned out that he he certainly was deserving of a a knighthood. And it was quite a nasty organisation. That is going back a a while. Her immediate predecessor was a guy called Ross McEwen. He was a good guy. uh, And he helped uh, change the culture of the bank. But Alison Rose deserves a huge amount of credit, I think, for that looking and feeling like a, a different organisation. It's just much nicer than it used to be. I mean, it, it does care about its customers. It's not looking to repossess homes or, or, or anything like that. It's trying to do the right thing. And a lot of that comes from her, I think. Do you think any of those changes, any of that kind of culture change you just mentioned will be rolled back now or will it sort of maintain the course? I, I think that the way that they talk about things will change. So they'll be less keen to to talk about their credentials here, there and everywhere since they've, since they've had this, this total embarrassment. But no, I actually think that the good parts of what Alison Rose has done will remain in place, I think. And I know she's a bit more than a bank manager, but the principle of banks not talking about the customers remains the same. 
Will she have trust issues when looking for a new job, do you think? Yeah, well, I think she's in trouble on that score. Um, she's not going to be the chief executive of uh, anything ever again, I shouldn't think. Certainly not of a bank. We needn't feel that sorry for her. She makes about somewhere between three and five million pounds a year. She'll get something similar as a payoff is, is a likely bet. She, you know, she'll be OK. My guess is that she goes underground for a year or so. And then you might see her crop up as a non-executive director on the boards of, of various companies and maybe a charity. And, you know, let's, let's hope she does do that. She's got a lot to offer still. That's it. And part of what she offers is obviously her campaigning for female entrepreneurs. And she obviously led a review on women in business for the Treasury. Is that a cause that can be picked up by anyone else? Or do you think she might maintain that kind of role, as you mentioned, in some form of charity? She might do, but I think that's one for the future. In the meantime, I think that strides have been made in that direction, partly thanks to her. And those things will continue. Since you've brought up the woman issue, I think one view certainly from women in the city is that were she male, she wouldn't have had to fall on her sword, that there would have been a different approach to this. It would have been, OK, he's made a mistake, but we're going to back him. There's certainly that view that there still exists uh, a certain amount of sexism in the city, and Alison Rose has, has paid a price for that. We've heard a lot from Nigel Farage over the last few weeks about this situation, but a key point that he's made is the question of should people have a right to a bank account in 2023 when they are so necessary for, for day-to-day life. Uh, what do you make of that question? What, how would you respond, do you think? Well, he's right, isn't he? They definitely should. And I think that he has brought an issue to light that hopefully in the end will benefit a lot of small firms and, and other people who've struggled with this issue, where they'll be able to say to, to banks, look, what information do you have on us that is making it difficult for us to bank with you? And possibly some of that information will turn out not to be true. So he, he may turn out here to have done a service for people other than, um, you know, his own profile. Pick up the Evening Standard newspaper for more news, interviews and analysis or head to standard.co.uk. That's The Leader. Thanks for listening. We're back tomorrow afternoon at four o'clock.